The rapture has taken place. The Christians who know what you're hearing now, gone. Everything that is what's called the restraining factor over society, over the school systems, people to stand up against the school board, they're all gone. The leftists are finally, I mean worldwide, worldwide, are going to get their way. We're not going to be there to stop them from burning the place down. We're talking about Revelations today, the book of Revelation, and in chapter 6, we started last week talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. What we found out was that it's four horses, but five entities that were with the four horses. This is going to give us an overview of the seven seals that Jesus breaks the seals. Keeping in mind, he only opens six seals. The seventh seal will be opened at the beginning of chapter 8. Now, here's what we need to know. There's seven seals. There's seven trumpets of judgment. Then there's seven bowls of judgment. The seventh seal is to introduce the seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet is to introduce the seven bowls. So I hope that doesn't sound confusing, but we'll go over it when we get to it. Okay, so part of that is saying we're transitioning. The seventh is the transition. There is deception. That is the Antichrist. In, uh, when the white horse comes out, many believe it's Christ. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and look at that. And here's what it says. In Revelations chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, Now I watch when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Just for the record, he has a bow. There's no arrows. A, 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 a bow without arrows means peace. The Antichrist, which is what this person either is or this entity will introduce the Antichrist. I don't want to be so dogmatic to say the Antichrist knows how to ride a horse. Whatever this is, because everything else in Revelation pretty much is symbolic. So whether it be an actual rider or that's just the symbolism or this entity, this demonic entity will enter into the Antichrist. You had a white horse. What a lot of people do is they accidentally think it's Jesus Christ. It's not Christ. Christ comes in chapter 19, but he doesn't have a bow and arrow or a bow only. He has a sword and he means business and it's going to get real and the judgment will be complete when that time comes. So, in Daniel 9, 27, because let's face it, virtually everything in the book of Revelation has a connection of some kind to the book of Daniel. And he, the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with many for one week. The one week he's referring to actually is symbolic of seven years. The seven days is seven years. It goes on to say, but in the middle of the week, many of you know this about Revelation, three and a half years and then three and a half years. Okay, in the middle of the seven years is when the treaty is broken with the Antichrist and Daniel is writing about it right here. Three and a half years, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering because the temple will be rebuilt. The red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer will then go back into its, its whole function of what they did as they sprinkled the ashes and had another sacrifice. And it's going to stop. Right when the Jews literally thought everything was back to the way it should be, they were all deceived. The rapture has taken place. The Christians who know what you're hearing now, gone. Everything that is what's called the restraining factor over society, over the school systems, people to stand up against the school board, they're all gone. The, the, the leftists are finally, I mean worldwide, worldwide, are going to get their way. God forbid they'd have no idea what, it's like, it's like a kid who literally wants to get back at his parents and burns the whole house down. And now he's homeless too. How dumb is that? But that's what they're doing. They're trying to burn the whole place down to prove a point 
Finally, we're not going to be there to stop them from burning the place down. We'll put an end to the sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolation. It's going to happen right at the three and a half year mark. And he's going, the Antichrist or Satan himself, the beast, is going to go into the temple and set up, whether it's his own throne or a statue of himself, and everyone's going to have to worship either him or the statue. He's going to deceive all the Jews into believing that this is their coming Messiah. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, fiery red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people should lay one another, and he was given a great sword. So the, the bow is put down, the sword is taken up, and war happens literally like a thief in the night, exact analogy of what happened in Israel when the, the people, the, the young people were at a dance party and they were still dancing as Hamas was coming in on their gliders with machine guns and the dancing was still taking place as the fire happened and people were dying all around. That's how fast it's going to happen. And let's continue on in 1 Thessalonians 5, where you yourself are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. And that is an analogy, but that's going to happen in a worldwide a global aspect. Like what happened in a small microcosm, that devastating demonic activity that we all witnessed almost in real time is going to happen worldwide. Quickly, overnight, it begins. Now it goes on in Revelation 13. Let's just jump ahead so that we see where we're heading. We're careening towards this. It caused all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or forehead. My belief only and I know many of you share this too, but literally, just uh, you could say almost moments ago, the thought of this was almost impossible for most of us. Then something happened, and then no matter where you went, if you didn't get your right hand or forehead scanned, people were getting angry. Scan me. Don't let me in. Don't wait. This person didn't get scanned. Don't let them in. Angela and I were going to the doctors, and they're like, mm -mm -mm. put on this. And let me scan you. Even when I went to a deacon's meeting, we were being scanned. Everybody was accustomed. Overseas and everywhere in the world, you had to have your right hand or forehead scanned. But everybody was demanding it. Not just saying, darn it, we got to do this again. They're like, no, I'm doing the right thing. I am virtuous. Scan me. I am disease free. <laughs> So that no one can buy or sell unless it has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man and his number is 666. God gives us everything we need to know. But nobody will be able to buy or sell. And right now they're inserting chips in people's hands. Just like we take our credit card and just wave it over that little device at Costco, you now wave your hand and it's a debit card and no, more, no one's allowed to steal your, your uh, information anymore because they have to cut your hand off to do it. And trust me, there will be a black market for that as well. Revelation chapter 6, 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. Now this is famine, pestilence, starvation. And its rider had a pair of scales in its hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, which basically means a loaf of bread will be a day's wage. $200 for a loaf of bread. Inflation will be increased beyond everything we could possibly imagine. Economic collapse and do not harm the oil or the wine. That basically was referring to that there will be wealthy with supplies. 
that it will not affect them in that moment, but we're going to find out what happens to them as well. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. Now, the pale is chloros, which means a gross, yellowy, green, pale horse. It's translated as pale, but it's really a greenish death. It's a color of death. And its rider's name was death. Here is the fifth rider. And Hades. So death and Hades came out with the final fourth horse following him. And what does it say? And they. It doesn't say as and, and he or it. And they. So, it's, so John is identifying there's two entities, two specters or whatever this is that we're witnessing. We're given authority over a fourth of the earth. So more than two billion people will die very quickly. Because it says right there, over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. We talked about that last week. And just for the record, if you weren't here, that in chapter 9 of Genesis, God said, after he blessed Noah and his family and said, go and, and multiply and fill the earth, he then said, and I will put dread and fear into the animals. Animals of the land, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and even the creepy crawly things. There will be dread and fear of humanity that I will insert in them. Read it. It's, it's verse 2 of chapter 9. But then, that blessing will be removed. And all the rats in the big city will get a taste of human flesh. And all the beasts of the earth and the bugs and the creepy crawlies, your worst nightmares will happen. Those weird B movies about the birds and, you know, they're, they're attacking people. What used to be just the eagles looking for a small rodent or a, or a fish is now going to be dive bombing humans. Okay, there's four weapons. Sword, famine, plague, and the wild beast. One-fourth of the world population dies. That's over two billion people. Now, let's continue on with the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. What we're going to see here is during the tribulation period, the seven years, there will be a great revival, the greatest revival ever recorded in human history will take place after the rapture. Many people, and I used to believe this, that there will be a great revival before the rapture. Turns out, as I continue to study, it seems the timing of it was off for me as far as when it was going to take place. It's going to take place after the rapture, during the tribulation. And those are the people who will be slaughtered, killed. It says they'll have their heads cut off. And these are the people under the altar. And they go on to say, They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves have been. In other words, it's not done yet. Now, it, we could read it many different ways, but we'll just say this. There's going to be many millions of people, believers, being slaughtered because of their faith. When he opened the sixth seal, by the way, this is the last of the seals in the chapter 6. I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. Number one, earthquake. Number two, the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. And the stars of the skies fell to the earth as the fig tree shed its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. Listen to the imagery of what's about to be read and allow your imagination to just play out what you're hearing. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. What are you envisioning? Now John saw a vision. There's no force on earth that could produce what he's seeing. All I know is it looked like a scroll. It looked like a scroll rolling in the sky. Do you know that right now we have enough nuclear weapons 
to incinerate every square inch of the earth in less than one hour. If every single button that can be pushed is pushed, within the hour, the entire globe is gone, dead. Here's something else that's fascinating. Uh, in uh, World War II, they dropped the atom bomb. That was devastating on Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Today, this is a fascinating fact, the atom bomb versus the nuclear bomb. The nuclear bomb is 35,000 times more powerful than the atom bomb. And we have enough to circle the globe and destroy the whole thing. Now, just like the pandemic, God says certain things are going to happen. He doesn't say who's going to do it. Is it going to be Bill Gates, Fauci? We don't know who. <laughs> Where is it going to come? People always say, well, it's got to come from a mysterious place that we don't know. That's how we're going to believe it. He, he, used at the hand, he, used, he judged Israel at the hand of Xerxes. He judged Israel at the hands of the Babylonians. He could cause plagues, famines, and everything else at the hands of the fools that, we're, that we see on the news every day. Just putting it out there. So what I'm saying is allow God to do, to do what God does best. Universal natural catastrophes, earthquakes, volcanic explosions, meteor showers, asteroids, and tsunamis are going to happen everywhere throughout the world, not just regionally. That's climate change. Oh, then <laughs> climate change. It, even the world knows it's heading in that direction, so they're, they're building their narrative. They're building their narrative to sideswipe what the truth is. And then in verse 15 through 17, then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful, these are the people, remember this, he said, don't touch the oil or the wine because the rich are saving. They have all of their supplies in place. They have their bunkers. Now, here we are. And what does it say? Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slaves and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling on the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? And they are going to know because this is almost prophetic in nature. They will not say because of global warming. They will not say because of pollution. They will not say because there wasn't enough wind power. John MacArthur says this, the people alive at that time will finally realize that all the disasters that have come upon them and their world are the results of God's wrath. Unwilling to repent, they will scream for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and crush them. They are so stubborn, even unto death, what they don't realize is that it is in death that their tragedy truly begins. People will be so terrified that they would rather die than face the wrath of the holy God, foolishly ignoring the fact that death will provide absolutely no escape from divine judgment. They are between a rock and a hard place, and all they needed to do was the simple thing, repent. Now, if you're here today, and you have been stubborn, I don't, I'm not thinking of anybody but Kevin, no. <laughs> if, if your story is, I will get in because I have an aunt that's a nun. I, I used to use that phrase. Or because your relatives are believers. Or because you at one time walked the aisle, but you've been living as if hell is your only destination. If that's you, realize that you might be amongst them and we do not want that. I do not want you to be there. I don't want you to be the, amongst the ones who are so still stubborn saying to the rocks, fall on me. Will you not repent of sin and say, finally, there's only one way to get to God. There's only one way. Would you mind if we pray and then I'm going to call up the nuptials? And this is just a prayer of salvation. Father, if there's anybody in this room right now who knows for a fact that they need you and they need to repent, Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you just touch their heart, move on them and let them know. Give them that sweet Holy Spirit conviction 
where it's that love that compels them to realize who you are and to repent. So, Father, we pray that they are converted now in Jesus' name, that they reach out to you, that they fall in love with you, and that they want to know you every day and to be transformed into the image of Christ so that they too can go to heaven and not go to hell, that they will be able to go up in the rapture and this room will be completely empty. We ask that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.